Okay. Okay. You're done. That's it? Yeah. Once I start typing, you can count after down. After 15 seconds, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you want to keep filming after. Yes, yes, yes. For a yes. while after. Okay. Uh, let's see. I just think one try. Okay, I saw your hand. Let's do it again. Just keep typing. <laughs> it's okay, we can... Maybe, maybe you just need the book closer yeah. to the typewriter. start typing stuff. Earthquake! 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 What an earthquake! <laughs> and he just keeps going because Dr. Paleo is a boss. Alright, I think that's good. Oops, oh, there we go, that's what I want. Good evening. I'm Detective Graham, paleo investigator. Paleontology is a field of science that the general public does not understand. I'm here to change that. Without further ado, let's talk about geoscience. Now, let's say we were to take a bunch of minerals or even a bunch of different rocks and grind them up into a powder. Now that powder could be as fine as baby powder or the grains could be as large as, say, a boulder. Whatever the case, let's say we were to take that powder and pack it together, almost like a snowball. If you were to do that, you would have in your hands a sedimentary rock. All this sandstone is, is a bunch of sand that's been packed so tightly together that it sticks together as a single cohesive unit instead of collapsing into a pile of sand on the ground here. Now, it doesn't have to be sand. Uh, if you were to, say, take a bunch of mud and pack that together, you'd have shale. If you were to take a bunch of boulders and pack those together, or even cobbles about this big, even smaller, you'd have yourself a conglomerate. Say, if you were to take a bunch of uh, fossils and pack them together, that's one way you can get a limestone or chalk. And if you were to take a bunch of plant material and pack that together, dead plant material,
you would have in your hands some coal. Good morning. I'm Dr. Paleo. Paleontology is a field of science that the general public doesn't understand. I'm here to change that. Without further ado, let's talk about geoscience. last couple of episodes, we talked about chemistry, rocks, minerals, plate tectonics. With the knowledge you've learned there, you can make many, many inferences about how the world works, how it was, and how it will be. In the episodes before that, we talked about biology, genetics, evolution, systematics. With those tools, you can learn about and make inferences of many, many different kinds of animal life, plant life, bacteria life, viruses even. But in this series, we're talking about very specific life. We're talking about ancient life. When we want to learn about ancient life, that is where geology and biology come together. To learn about ancient life, the very first thing you should look to are fossils. A fossil is any sort of remains of previous life, be it bone, shell, footprints even, perhaps even just a chemical residue left by a bacterial net. Now, we will talk uh, about how we find fossils and how they're, say, prepared for museums or for study later on in the episode. But first, I would like to talk about how fossils form. Like, I don't 
kind of hard to get a good mud consistency. It's so grainy. Yeah, totally. And it, all it is is space filler, so it really is not like plaster where it's making it perfectly. Fun. What's that? This is fun. Yeah. I haven't done something like this. This is what a bone fossil looks like after being unearthed from the ground. You can see it's a bit of a different color from the rest of the sand around it. That is because of the chemicals inside of the petrified fossil. Um, <clears throat> uh, plants absolutely love the minerals inside of these bones and it's not uncommon for fossils in rainforests to be destroyed by roots barreling down uh, through the fossil to suck up uh, minerals such as uh, phosphorus. Um, the fossil at the moment is being cleaned off and once the entire top has been cleaned off, it will be plastered and taken into the laboratory. Ooh, ooh. Oh, ooh, that. There's part of one. You got one? Part of one. Oh, sure. Where's the other? Um, it was on the back of this. Oh, was it floor? That's probably a really shitty one.
However, molecular evidence does suggest that green algae, such as Odogonium and Hematococcus here, are in fact related to cryptomonads, such as Cryptomonas here. And in this episode, we will talk about the green algae, the cryptomonads, and the red algae. between red algae and green algae, other than where they fall on the tree of life? Well, their ancestors are the only known instances of a eukaryote cell consuming a cyanobacterium and adopting it for photosynthesis. This has only happened to our knowledge twice in the history of all living things. Once in green algae, such as Oodogonium, and once in red algae. The cyanobacterium that each one consumed was a different species. And so actually, red algae photosynthesis is a little different than the photosynthesis carried out by green algae, such as the land plants. This is very important because all other photosynthetic eukaryotes are photosynthetic because they gobbled up either a red alga cell or a green alga cell. What are examples of those? Voucheria is a, a stramina pile. They are descended from a eukaryote that went over and gobbled up red algae. So these have inside of them the remains of red algae. Really all that's left are the cyanobacteria chloroplasts from that red algae, but you can see the thin cell membrane of the red alga around each little chloroplast. Cryptomonas is another alga that has red algae inside of it. Um, cryptomonads descend from an ancestor that consumed a red alga cell and kept it around inside the cell to carry out photosynthesis. Now I do not have examples of them to show right now, but if you'd like an example of something that consumed a green algal cell, a uh, euglena is, a, is an organism that we'll talk about in a later episode photosynthesizes thanks to the green algae inside of its cells. We'll talk about that at a later date. We will talk about stramina piles such as voucheria, kelp, and diatoms at a later date. James, if it was entirely up to well, you. Well, thanks for this. Now, you know, I can send you GPS coordinates and on a Google Maps, too. Okay. So, like, um, but just those ones over there, not this. Give me an opinion. Brandon, you'd rather say, right? Well, you're going to you're gonna buy the stuff and mail it or have it sent yeah. to you. Yeah, I'll just do it. Like, so, um, no, like, I've been rethinking it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm yeah. Like, All right. Now, the first arcade plastid that we're going to look at is Stygioclonium, which is in the Erlenmeyer flask right here. It's a chlorophycium green alga. 
which means that although it's on the same branch of the tree of life as plants, it's not that closely related to them. You could think of these almost like uh, sponges uh, compared to you. Now, no, start over. examples of chlorothysian green algae. Uh, the first is Budogonium. The second is Chlamydomonas. The third is Stygioclonium. And the fourth is Fritchiella. The chlorothysians are one of the three clades in the UTC group of green algae, which means that these four species right here are more closely related to sea lettuce than they are to broccoli. Now, the, I picked these four groups because they each are a bit interesting. Budogonium is a green alga that creates a filament. You might be able to see it in this Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, it's multicellular, but it probably evolved multicellularity independently of plants. Uh, this, gener uh, this genus is known from the, the Cryogenian period all the way back in the Proterozoic Eon. Uh, in fact, it's known from fossils older than the oldest animal. Uh, it, from the uh, snowball earth period, or point in earth's history. This is Chlamydomonas. You might look in this flask and maybe you see some green, but there isn't really anything, it doesn't really look like there's anything in here. That is because Chlamydomonas is microscopic. There's so much in here though, that its green color has caused this entire water to be green. Now it might not look like much, but we owe almost everything that we know about photosynthesis and genetics to this green alga right here. It is the model organism for haploid genetic studies, and uh, it was through studying Chlamydomonas that scientists learned about the Calvin cycle, which is a very, very, very important part of the photosynthesis carried out by plants. Uh, Fritchella here is interesting, you can see it there, in that scientists used to think that this was the ancestor of the land plants. Now we know that that's not the case. Again, this is a chlorophycian, which means that it's more closely related to sea lettuce than it is to any land plant. However, the fact that it can live in terrestrial environments uh, made scientists early on think that it must have been the ancestor to the land plants. However, like everything here, it evolved multicellularity independently. Now this last one is Stygioclonium. You might be able to see it in this flask. I don't know if you can see it in this video. Uh, but it's interesting in that it lives in fresh water and it doesn't really sit by itself. It will typically uh, bond, or not bond, but attach itself to other plants and it will sit on the other plants and grow. Now Stygioclonium, and its, its cousins do have a fossil record. They have a better fossil record than most green algae, uh, other than plants, but it's not that great. It actually doesn't go that far back. It's got a better fossil record than, say, Chlamydomonas here, or Fritchiella, but uh, that's, that's about it. Even diatoms have a better fossil record than 
these guys do. Now, some green algae, such as Chlamydomonas here, is microscopic, or microscopic. You can't really see them with your own eye uh, like you could, say, my hand. And some, such as Stygioclonium, are macroscopic. We can see them, but we can't really distinguish any features of them at all. So, to look at most green algae, what you have to do is prepare one for observation in a microscope. And let's do that right now. some of these microscopic green algae really look like. Now, chlorophyce and algae aren't just important for studying genetics and photosynthesis. In this vial, you probably barely even see anything. And if I get really close to the camera, it might look completely clear. But there's a chlorophyce algae, alga in here, that's very, very interesting to scientists because it is altruistic. Uh, that is to say, some members of a colony of this genus, Volvox, will sacrifice themselves in order to help another member of their colony reproduce. Uh, it's as classic as altruism gets, and this is the organism that scientists study when they're trying to learn what genetic processes cause altruistic behavior in living things. That's all. Here's a close-up of Volvox, which is sitting at the bottom of this vial right now.
Green algae, like animals, can tolerate a number of different environments. Whether it's hot, or whether it's cold. Whether it's hot,
Now, when I say that bivalves are one of the or one of the dominant living things uh, in the oceans during the Jurassic and Cretaceous, that might be a little strange thing to hear, because I mean, even if you look at prehistoric bivalves from that time, such as Glycimeris right here, or Inoceramus right here, they seem to be just pretty much ordinary clams um, that maybe you'd even see in the ocean today, a lot like a mercenaria right here. However, in addition to Glycimeris and Inoceramus and many other clams, mussels, and oysters, there was another group of bivalves that are extinct today called the rudest clams. Take a look at this. This is Hippurites. There are actually two of them here. This is one. This is the other. Hippurites and the other rudest clams were a group of clams that evolved to be a lot like a uh, coral. And actually, these were the main builders of reefs in the Cretaceous period. If you can think of that, there weren't coral reefs, there were clam reefs of these rudest clams. And they sat at the bottom of the ocean, a lot like this, um, and uh, they filtered food out of the water, a lot like a sponge does, or a lot like many clams do today. If you're having trouble seeing this as a clam, let me help you. This comb that you see right here is one of the two valves of the clam shell. The other valve is actually up top right here. It's really, really flat. Um, and when this animal was alive, it would pop the top valve up just a little bit, almost like the lid of a honey pot. And the animal sitting inside would filter any food out of the water that passed through the, um, the pot. Now that's actually just one hypothesis. Another thought is that many rudest clams uh, had uh, photosymbionts. That is to say, they had living things inside of them that helped them photosynthesize and create food from sunlight. So perhaps these rudest clams, with their rather transparent uh, upper valves, it's hard to see on this one, perhaps they sat there without even opening their valves and just let light shine through and they got food from that. Very, very interesting group of animals that went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. We do not know precisely why rudest clams went extinct. Um, they, their populations began to wane near the end of the Cretaceous, so we're not quite sure if they went extinct just before the asteroid struck or because of the asteroid, but there are no rudest clams alive today and the position of reef builder has firmly been taken from the clams. It is now something that algae, sponges, and coral dominate. Perhaps due to uh, the lack of calcium in oceans today, which rudest clams needed lots and lots of calcium in the water to build their shells. So without calcium, we might guess that the rudest clams were not able to build their shells as well, and that might have been what led to their eventual downfall. Now, this is just one form that rudest clams could take. This is Hipporides, but some of them are pretty small, such as this rudest clam, whose genus is Dicerus. This one's very small, and it probably sat at the bottom of the ocean like that. And it, this is one valve, here's the other, and it probably just separated them a little bit so it could filter stuff out of the water. Or, there's this rudest clam, which sat at the bottom of the ocean like that. You can pretty easily see the upper valve here. This column is the lower valve, and this right here is actually the upper valve the hinge right here. So it probably sat sort of like that, 
and then it open its valve just a little bit so that it could filter food out of the water. Now, in addition to rudists, there's another group of clams that are pretty crazy. Uh, actually, two, there are shipworms, which bore into wood, and there are angel wings. What I'm holding is a rock. It's not a fossil, it's just a rock. All these holes you see were made by a clam that dug into this rock. It's pretty incredible. You can't do that. Uh, you would need very special tools to break into rock like this, but this was done by a type of clam called an angel wing. Um, and you can see similar holes like this in wood uh, due to shipworms, which aren't worms, they're, they're clams. Uh, Torito is the genus of shipworm. I do not know which genus of angel wing did this, but angel wings are from the family. Uh, I've got a little slip here to read it to you properly. They are from the family Philodomyidae. Philodomyidae. 